Hello everybody, this is 101 Face here. So, some time ago, I asked you guys to send me some questions for a Q&A video. Uh, that was back in, uh... Wow, that was in January? Holy sh- Well, after much procrastination and season 13, to be fair, here's the Q&A video I promised. Now, first things first, I'm well aware that this is the 10th anniversary of Curious Mind, and believe me, I originally had big ideas for a celebratory video. But unfortunately, as I hope you could tell from the latest episodes, Season 13 took a lot out of me. Uh, I've never been bummed out making one of these videos before, but holy crap, that legitimately took some toll. So I've been trying to recharge my creative mind ever since, and yeah, I really didn't want to rush what I had in mind. I'm sure I'll still make it at some point, but for now, let's just celebrate with this Q&A video. I'm going to combine some of the more similar questions together when appropriate, and timestamps will be listed in the description. Also, some of the questions I received back then have since been answered thanks to Season 13, so I will point those out when I see them. So, in no particular order, here are the questions and my answers. Konstantin Kamenko asks, when's the next season? Well, obviously, at the time you asked me that question, Season 13 was still in production, so... Let's move that forward and talk about Season 14 instead. And honestly, I have no idea. I think I'll probably start production for Season 14 sometime in the winter for this year. I can never say for sure these days, to be honest. I generally aim to finish an episode every week, but that's becoming more and more difficult to maintain. So, yeah, I can't tell you exactly when it'll be out, but I will definitely let people know when I start production. Konstantin Kamenko and John Van Baslik asks, What's your favorite and least favorite season slash episode so far? Oh my god, that is a tough one. I think my favorite season would be season 10, which is the one that revolved around the Gomorrah. Uh, the reason for that is because this was where I really started to try and give the courier a bit more empathy. Uh, in retrospect, I think I should have started doing that much earlier, so it would have been more of a smooth transition. But, hey, it's uh, <laughs> better late than never. But my favorite episode is actually Season 5, Episode 9. This was when the Courier first used a stealth boy to try and infiltrate the Gunrunners. Uh, it was just a fun episode to write and to voice, really. I... Just remember having a great time referencing Batman and uh, writing things that I normally wouldn't get to write on this show. Uh, now, my least favorite season is season 9, and that's because of the technical difficulties I had. I'm not 100% sure to this day why the game was so unstable for this season in particular, but I suspect it's because my save file was becoming corrupted. Um, towards the second half of the season, this game was just crashing constantly, and depending on the time, a crash can set me back a long way. Uh, this was also the season where a bug with Boone's personal crest hit me in the face. Uh, I'm gonna come back to this later in a different question, but the bug was so bad that it ruined my release schedule. Season 9 was supposed to be released back in autumn 2017. I was trying to get it finished during the summer break uh, of my second master's degree, but those problems delayed my progress until it was time for me to start a new term. Plus, I was starting a new job around that time, so yeah, even though there were some good moments in Season 9, stressful production experience equals least favorite season so far, as far as I'm concerned. And as for least favorite episode, I remember not being very happy with the quality of some of the episodes in Season 4. Five, mostly because I was working on the time limit back then, and I started churning out some very uninspired writing. So yeah, writer's block plus time limit also equals bad episodes, as far as I'm concerned. Potato Hedgehog and Uncle Ned wants to know, what's my favorite quote to say as the courier? And also, what's my favorite joke or gag? And according to Potato Hedgehog, his favorite is, SON OF A ONE-EYED MUTANT! Bitch! <laughs> yeah, well, that's a very strong candidate, I have to admit. Um, see, the problem is, I don't have a single answer for this. I think, generally speaking, the final line I say in every trailer is my personal favorite in the season. Uh, if not my absolute favorite, then it's definitely up there. 
off the top of my head, my absolute favorite might be a tie between when the courier first found Maria. Death, I hope you're listening because there's no doubt about it. You're my bitch now. And his final line against Caesar. You fool! You can't beat me! You know why? Because I'm more of a nut job than you! But my favorite running gag would have to be the Chupacabra. Mainly because of how long I was able to stretch that out. I mean, it started from season 3 and went all the way to season 11. And a bit more recently, there was my very ham-fisted attempt at making a Pulp Fiction reference. Purely because there was a character called Jules. Does he look like a bitch? What? Not you, buddy. That guy. See, unlike you, he doesn't look like a bitch. Say bitch, be cool! Say bitch, be cool! Hey, be cool, man. Be cool. Now, when you yell at me, it makes me nervous. And when I get nervous, I get scared. And when motherfuckers get scared, that's when motherfuckers accidentally get shot. You know, when you talk to people like that, that makes them nervous. And when they get nervous, they get scared. And holy shit, when people get scared these days, uh, use your imagination. Look, you want to play blind man, go walk with the shepherd. But me, my eyes are wide fucking open. Wealthy? <laughs> well, if you want to play the blind man, then go right ahead. But my eyes are wide fucking open. Yeah, I don't think anyone actually picked up on those references. Philip and- oh shit. Gutierrez. Philip Gutierrez, Tyler Murray, and Seth B343 all wants to know what is my favorite Fallout New Vegas quest and why? Also, would I want the career to run into it? Woohoo, this is a very difficult question for me to answer. Um, see, the problem here is that I've played Fallout New Vegas so many times now that honestly, I can't remember my initial feelings of the game anymore regarding individual quests. So, if you asked me this question way back after I first played it, I would have given you a different answer, I'm pretty sure. But, I uh, don't really have a single answer to this now because I like different quests for different reasons. So, you know what, I'm gonna give you three quests that stand out to me. Number one is Bye Bye Love. This is a quest you get from the Gamora where you're trying to help out Joanna and Carlitos. Now, I really like this quest because it almost feels like it could be its own movie. You have a cast of characters that are quite endearing in my opinion, especially Joanna. It gives you a lot of perspectives on what it's like to work in a place like Gamora. Uh, there's a lot of tension building up to a climax, and it's not reliant on action. As far as an enclosed piece of narrative goes, I really enjoyed this quest. And it also ties in with another quest I want to highlight, which is... How Little We Know. So, once again, this is set in the Gamora, and here we get to explore the other side of this casino, that being the Ometas themselves. So, as part of this quest, we really get to see just how depraved things can get in this game, which is why I put it up here. I know that some people like to highlight Nipton as an example of how dark this game can be, which I agree is a powerful moment. But I personally prefer the Gomorrah as the best example, mainly because right off the bat, you already have an expectation that whatever you're gonna find in here, it's gonna be pretty bad. But then the game pushes things one step further with characters like Kachino and Clandon. For me personally, the revelation of what Clandon was doing caught me off guard. So killing him and taking out the bosses was incredibly satisfying. The game didn't simply tell you that these guys are monsters. It gave you a chance to find out for yourself. And finally, I would like to nominate Come Fly With Me. This questline basically had a bit of everything. It's got good lore, good characters, good action, and a really satisfying conclusion. I mean, you get to launch rockets to the sound of Ride of the Valkyries for goodness sake. I don't think I need to say anything else. Now, you may be wondering why I didn't include any DLC quests in this. That's mainly because, as far as I'm concerned, a lot of the DLCs are really structured like just one very long quest that has been artificially split into multiple ones. Think about Dead Money, for instance. The quests there were really just steps for the overall story. If we classify Dead Money as a single quest, then yeah, that will be up there on the list as well. Jeremy Owens asks, do you have any plans on making a Curious Mind audio series with a fully recorded cast of voiceover actors who are also fans of Fallout? 
Wow, that's a very specific thing you're asking about there. Almost like you tried to pitch an idea at me. <laughs> well, I approve. That's a really cool idea. I'm not sure what kind of stories I would tell, but now that you've got me thinking, I guess a pretty major limiting factor would be the quality of voice actors and their availability. So I might have to adapt the story based on who we have access to. I don't want to promise anything on a whim, but I do like the audio series format. I'll just add this to my growing list of ideas I don't have time to work on. Um, while we're on the subject, if anyone knows about any projects that need a voice actor, then drop me a message. I'm always looking for opportunities to practice my voice acting. Guil832 asks, Did you take any premeditated steps to make Courier's Mind a different experience from Freeman's Mind, or did it just come naturally as you developed the series? So I think it's a mix of both. The two things I actively wanted to include for the series right from day one was custom conversations with NPCs and conversations between the companions. I think that's the number one difference between Korea's Mind and Freeman's Mind. I mean, Gordon Freeman doesn't try to interact with the story of the game in any serious way. Um, there are two really good examples of this that I can think of. So in Half-Life 1, Freeman launched a missile by accident, right? If he paid attention to what the scientists were trying to tell him, he would have known that they wanted him to do this and why. Second example is how he behaved during his first interaction with Alex in Half-Life 2. He barely acknowledged her existence, and he either didn't hear some of the very key plot points, or outright ignored them. I did not want to do that in a game like Fall New Vegas. <laughs> Instead, uh, my plan was to embrace the story, but critique it. So, the courier wouldn't just say to Caesar, you're crazy, I want to go home. Instead, he's going to listen to what Caesar says, explain exactly why it makes no sense, and then tell him he's crazy. And um, any other deviations from Freeman's mind were either unintentional or out of necessity. Uh, for example, I think it's pretty obvious that I'm not as good at writing comedy as Ross Scott. That man doesn't just have a pair of funny bones. Every one of his bones is a funny bone that he can switch on and off at will. The Schrodinger's bones. I, I can only manage two on a good day. So... That kind of further molded the series to be less overtly funny and more dramatic. I mean, there are some pretty dark and heavy moments in Fallout New Vegas anyway, so I guess it kind of fits. Guio also asks, At which point did you realize that you would be borrowing only Ross Scott's format and using it to create your own distinct project? Uh, I don't think there was a single moment. I stopped trying to consciously channel Freeman at around about Season 3. Uh, coincidentally, that was when our first human companion joined the group. I think having the companions did a lot to help me think less like Freeman and more like a new character. Because frankly, I can't imagine someone like Gordon Freeman would ever voluntarily take any companions with him. Apart from maybe Rex. I don't think he would want anyone that can talk back. Good old Guil then asks, In which ways do you see the courier as being different from Freeman? in terms of character and how they approach the different situations they're in. I have some ideas regarding that last one, but I'd like to know yours. So I kind of answered that already, but let me elaborate. Gordon Freeman rarely hold in-depth conversations with anyone. Uh, most of the time he's either talking over them, flat out ignoring them, or just giving very simple answers, uh, right before trying to take the conversation in a wildly different tangent. Uh, that is a fair enough approach, I think, for a linear game like Half-Life 1, where the story is mostly told through the environments, and you literally can't have a two-way conversation with the NPCs anyway, but obviously that wouldn't work with an RPG like Fallout. I mean, you could in theory roleplay a character like Freeman, who shoots first and asks questions later, but knowing the Fallout fanbase, that would just piss people off. So the simple fact that the courier is willing to hold a full conversation with people instead of immediately blowing them off, I think he's more diplomatic and reasonable than Freeman. Also, I like to think that the courier doesn't actively hate people the way Freeman often does. Freeman comes off, to me anyway, as someone who can barely function in a normal society, whereas the courier functions slightly better, especially in a post-nuclear wasteland society. 
And uh, finally, I think the Curry is more likely to go out of his way to do something that he considers the right thing to do, as opposed to whatever works best for himself. Part of the reason I wrote him like that is because it allows me to explore more of what the quests have to offer, as opposed to just shooting everybody and going for the simplest resolution. Uh, I think as the series go on, the courier is becoming less selfish to the point where Freeman would consider him to be a goody two-shoes and or has a death wish. So, yeah, I guess that's the ultimate difference. Freeman do heroic things either by accident or he has no other choice, whereas the courier do heroic things because he wants to or because he genuinely thinks is the right thing to do. Eye of Evil Good asks, what reasons you had for the chosen quest resolutions in such quests as Veronica's Companion Quest or the Prim Sheriff? Uh, well, as a general rule, I try to pick options that gives the quote-unquote best ending, but a lot of the times that's obviously subjective. So in that case, I would look at things on a case-by-case -case basis. So speaking of Prim, my original reasoning was that the courier didn't really have enough experience with the NCR at that point to trust them, especially considering how understaffed their forces were already. I mean, they relied on external help to clear out the town to begin with. Also, siding with the NCR in this case would only make sense if he was planting his flag with the NCR, whereas Myers could work with any ending except the Legion. So from a writer's perspective, Myers was the more flexible choice. And as for Prim Slim, that robot was barely capable of guarding the Viking advance, so there's no way the courier would have considered using him as the sheriff. Also, I don't think the courier has the necessary science skill to reprogram him in the first place. Looking back on this quest, um, the fact that you asked this question kind of illustrates how far my writing has come over the years. If I approach this quest today, I would definitely explain in the episode why he eliminated certain options. Now, regarding Veronica's, the reasoning is exactly what he stated in the episode. He respected her own choices, and staying with the Brotherhood was her default option. Eye of Evil Good also asked, which was the most amusing bug you had personally encountered during the filmings? Well, I've been using fan-made patches since the very beginning, so I actually didn't encounter that many problems. Uh, some of the bigger ones I did encounter were not amusing in the slightest. <laughs> uh, they were actually game-breaking. So, I already mentioned Boone's personal quest. Uh, it's basically that bit where you stay overnight at Coyote Tail Ridge, and what's supposed to happen is the moment the game fades back in after you stay there overnight, uh, Boone should automatically trigger a conversation. Well, when I got to that part, Boone never started the conversation, so my character was stuck in place the whole time. Uh, the game was basically waiting for a script to trigger. I eventually resorted to using console commands to skip certain uh, quest checkpoints to force the game to progress. So yeah, that was not amusing at all. Uh, but for actually amusing bugs, uh, here are four instances that I can actually remember. Right, so the first... Uh, well, the first two, actually, were caught on screen. In Season 3, Episode 2, when the courier was heading towards Nipton for the first time, the smoke didn't appear until he was really close to the settlement, because I had the draw distance turned all the way down. I, I was using my old laptop back then, so I couldn't really think of a way around this, so I had to pretend that the courier's eyes were still messed up from the bullet wounds. And then in the same episode, that lone survivor ended up getting stuck on a piece of geometry. So again, I had to turn away very quickly and improvise a line. Uh, looking back on this, I guess I could have reshot the whole sequence, but my previous save file was too far back. That is a common problem with this series. A single crash or something getting messed up at the wrong time could set me back a long way. And then in Season 9, as part of the Great Khan's questline, I had to make a delivery to Don Hostetler in the Crimson Caravan. Well, for some weird reason, when I was playing through that part during planning, this character was missing from the world. Uh, once again, Khan's commands came to the rescue, and it turns out he somehow spawned outside of the world's boundaries and was just walking forever into the void. Now thankfully, you can force NPCs to spawn where your character is currently, so it wasn't a big problem, but wow, that guy went on an odyssey. 
And finally, the fourth bug that I can think of wasn't really a bug per se, but I think it fits with the general spirit. Again, in Season 9, the first time I met Papa Carr, he had a weird pair of red tinted sunglasses and a custom helmet. I didn't remember seeing this the first time I played through the game, but as I was going through the conversation, the sunglasses kept glitching out whenever he moved his head. I originally thought it was a texture bug and couldn't figure out how to get rid of it. Well, it turns out this was actually a cut item that got added back in by the Mission Mojave fan patch. I guess they tried to reintegrate some cut content, but now I can see why this was cut in the first place. But yeah, once again, a couple of console commands later and I got it resolved. Dexy asked, will you do a crossover with Matt's Mind or Hunter? So, in case you didn't know, Hunter is the creator of Matt's Mind, which started as a Fallout 3 Mind series. Um, I actually did do a joint Q&A video with him back in 2015. Uh, we haven't really spoke much since then, I watched his streams a couple of times, but that's about it. But I'm totally open for a collaboration of some kind. I don't think it would be a crossover setting one of our shows like how Body's Mind and Shepherd's Mind did this, mainly because Hunter is doing that thing where the Lone Wanderer and the Courier are the same person. So he has recently left the Capital Wasteland and he's now starting Fallout New Vegas himself. So it wouldn't really make sense for both Matt and my Courier to meet. Speaking of which, uh, in Season 7 Episode 10, I actually made a reference to Matt's Mind. Wasteland Survival Guide? What the hell? Surely this wasn't printed before the war. Well, clearly it's not that effective considering the owners are dead. Let's see. Lead author and subject matter expert, The Lone Wanderer. Wow, of all the cliched pen names you could have gone for, you went for the least snappy one. Assistant author, Moira Brown. For the hard of hearing, please enable the Pit Boy speech functions for the audio version of this book. The Pit Boy has a speech function? Like an AI? Ha! Fuck that! As if Eddie wasn't enough! Now this was back when I wasn't sure if it would go into Fallout New Vegas, so I left the possibility of our characters existing in the same universe open. Way back then, I did have an idea for the two characters to have some kind of telephone conversation from across the continent, but beyond Fallout, there's no reason why we couldn't do a collaboration in some other way. I don't have any ideas off the top of my head, but yeah, if anyone have any suggestions, then feel free to let me know. I think he's running a pretty tight schedule right now, judging by how many different shows he has going on, but I'm certainly up for it. Now, a couple of quick questions that are quite simple to answer, mainly because they're either spoilers or I've already answered them in Season 13, but let's just go through them anyway, why not? Dexy asked, will the Korea's real name come up at some point, maybe before or during Lonesome Road? Well, clearly a spoiler. John Von Baslake asks, any hints as to whether the Courier will actually side with Bobby or if Vegas will be under new management? Well, go and watch Season 13 if you really want to know. Papa G asked, Do you plan at one point to reveal more of the Courier's past? Well, more spoilers. Besides, that's kind of what Lonesome Road is going to be about, so... Doom 7 ish asked, How are you going to approach the rest of the game? Well, keep watching, buddy. Kanatokisho asked, when are you going to save Raul's ass? Well, as of Season 13, you can consider his ass saved. And now, ladies and gentlemen, prepare yourselves for the most frequently asked question I've ever received in Fallout New Vegas. Are you planning to do all the DLCs in New Vegas? How will you approach the DLCs? In what order will you be taking all the DLCs? All at once or one at a time? Yeah. Thankfully, now that Season 13 is done, you should have your answer to, well, at least a couple of those questions. Anything else would be spoilers. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, I pulled a Marvel and uh, I included a post credit scene. Just go watch Season 13, Episode 10 all the way to the end. You know what I mean. And that's the end of part 1 for this Q&A session. I've got more questions lined up for part 2, including a question that's gonna get a very lengthy answer. But for now, I just want to end with this. Thank you all so much for your amazing feedback to Season 13 Episode 10. I was definitely taking a risk with the tone for that one, but I'm very glad it paid off. Oh, and if you have any more new questions that you want me to answer, leave a comment and I might just add them to a part 3 or something. But for now, thanks for watching, I'll see you all next Monday.